Whether it's a small patio garden or a 100 acre botanic garden, the very finest gardens have an amazing way of reconnecting us to nature. Today's garden is no exception. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we Garden Smart from Texas. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with miracle Grow. The oldest botanic garden in Texas is located in Fort Worth, just a stone's throw from its vibrant and bustling downtown. The gardens are home to over 2,500 species that are carefully planted on 109 acres of rolling hills. There are 21 unique specialty gardens that give visitors the opportunity to experience native and exotic plants in a wide variety of designs and settings. The gardens were built to be a sanctuary for their community and have been focused on educating gardeners of all ages since they opened their doors in 1934. From expansive views to quiet private spaces, the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens has the artful touch of an impressionistic painter. Steve Huddleston is a senior horticulturalist and has been with the gardens for nearly 20 years. He's a co-author of Easy Gardens for North Texas and a writer for Gardens Magazine. Today, Steve will share with us what makes his Texas oasis one of the finest botanic gardens in the United States. Steve, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, it's nice to have you here in the garden. Thank you. Steve, tell me, what was it that initially sparked your interest in gardening? Well, my parents enjoyed working in the yard. My grandmother did, my great-granddad did, so I think it was bound to w rub off on me. And uh, actually, I started uh, working in the yard when I was three, so. Wow. And did you pursue an education in horticulture? Well, I did. I went to Oklahoma State University, got a degree in horticulture, and then I got a master's degree from the University of Arizona. Wonderful. You've been here at the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens for quite some time. What is it that brought you here? Uh, well, there was a job opening, <laughs> and uh, that was 19 years ago. Found out about an opening here, and I applied for it, and I got the job, uh, and I've uh, been here ever since. Wow. Inside of 20 years, I'm sure there's many, many different hats that you've worn. What are some of the things that you've done here? Well, for the most part, I'm involved in garden administration. We, uh, we manage the garden on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that involves uh, administration, uh, that involves budget, that involves uh, uh, purchasing plants, uh, uh, planning out color displays, uh, managing personnel, dealing with special events, setting up for those events. Uh, I've done a lot of TV and radio work and I've co-authored a book, so it's been an interesting job. Indeed. It sounds like you're a man that never gets bored. That's true. <laughs> well, I know you've got a lot of really exciting things for us to see. Let's go ahead and dive in. Well, let's do. Steve, our first stop on the garden tour of the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens is the Fuller Garden. What can you tell me about this place? Well, this is a 3.25 acre strolling garden, Eric, and uh, it's uh, dedicated to Adelaide Polk Fuller, a, a woman of Fort Worth, and uh, the garden is supposed to look like an impressionistic painting. It combines light splashes of color uh, and lots of shapes. Uh, to give you the effect of a painting. And at the same time, it shows or uh, mimics uh, the journey that we take through life, uh, childhood, the prime of adulthood, uh, and then the end of life when we have a chance to sit and look back on life. Wow, it's a beautiful place. One thing I notice as we walk through this garden is it looks like you've got a number of monochromatic designs or, you know, 
similar colors grouped together and it's a really interesting way to see these plants that have similar colors and um, you know basically all all put together into a wonderful design. Exactly. You go through certain color zones in this garden. Uh, there's a gray area where we're standing now. There's a blue area. Uh, there's an area where we feature a lot of reds, yellows, and oranges. And then we have some pastels as well. So uh, a lot of color zones. We're in the gray garden right now, I'm yes. assuming, or the silver mm -hmm. garden. Yes. What are some of the plants that have worked particularly well for you here? Well, here we have the uh, Texas sage. This is a, a gray leaf shrub native to West Texas that does well here in the Metroplex. Uh, we've got the uh, Powers Castle Artemisia here. It's a nice perennial. The Weeping Blue Atlas Cedar uh, is a beautiful accent plant, uh, focal point there. Uh, we have Catoni Aster over here with gray foliage. Behind me is the uh, Silver Leaf Texas Mountain Laurel. It's a variety called Silver Sierra. Uh, silver leaves, purple f uh, flowers in the spring. Uh, so it's just a nice uh, area that features those colors, yes. It's wonderful. We can see off in the distance of a blue garden, which is, um, you know, of course, a wonderful contrast with silver. It's a it's a receding color, right? And which which kind of draws us from this brighter part of the garden, you know, into you know that deeper, richer blue. What are some of the plants that you like there? Well, we've got the blue Mediterranean fan palm. That's mm -hmm. a beautiful plant in that area. We also have some blue salvias. We have rosemary, which has blue flowers in late winter, early spring. Uh, Amsonia is another blue flowering plant. So uh, those are cool, refreshing colors. It's a nice area to walk through, especially in the summer. Absolutely. And we can't leave this garden without talking about the hardscape. There's just some amazing stone walls, and, and this, of course, would have been extremely painstaking work, and, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Well, it is. It's a nice layout. A lot of uh, stone walls, retaining walls, uh, walks uh, that wind through the garden. As you said, this is a strolling garden, and so we're really forced to slow down and wind through this garden just as we wind through life, and that's what this garden represents. Let's talk about the, the dry creek bed, which I think is a really, really neat feature. Well, that's uh, on the western side of this garden here along the tree line, and a dry creek bed gives the illusion of water without there being any water in the bed. So that's a nice effect. And then along that bed, we feature a lot of Texas natives. We have our Texas state grass, side oats grandma, red yucca, uh, Texas mountain laurel, the Texas persimmon, the Mexican buckeye, all native plants that do well on less water. Well, it's a beautiful place. I love the design. The layout is, is so thoughtfully prepared, and you know it does force us to slow down and contemplate every every piece of this garden. Exactly. Very well done. Thank you. Well, Eric, here we are in the Rose Garden now. This is one of our signature gardens at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. Uh, it's certainly one of our oldest gardens. Uh, actually, it was dedicated in 1933. Uh, but anyway, the Rose Garden consists of four parts. Here we are on the ramp. We go down to the Lower Rose Garden, then we move to the Republic of Texas Rose Garden, and then we finish with the Oval Rose Garden. Steve, how are the four different parts of the garden different from a design standpoint? Well, uh, this is the, the main part right here. This is what people come and see. We have a lot of weddings here. Uh, and then we uh, go through a colonnade, and adjacent to the colonnade is our Republic of Texas Rose Garden. The Rose Society wanted to uh, install a rose garden that represented the years of the Texas Republic and the roses that were in cultivation at that time. So uh, the years of the Republic were 1836 to 1845. All the roses that we feature in the Republic of Texas Rose Garden are old garden roses. They were growing at that time. And then the Oval Rose Garden is just another garden. It has an oval shape and it features a lot of old garden roses as well as some of the earth kind roses that we feature. I love the architecture of this part of the garden, the ramp. Uh, but it just has a very old world feel to it, an incredible vista. Well, it does. In fact, this was inspired uh, by an Italian garden, Via Lante. Uh, and Hare and Hare was the architect, landscape architect firm from Kansas City that designed this back in the 30s. As I said, construction started in 1932 with the Civil Works Administration. This was the first public relief project in Tarrant County. The garden was completed in 34 and dedicated then. So there's a lot of history. Uh, this garden is on the National Register of Historic Places. Now you mentioned you've got some of the old Texas historic roses. Um, are the lion's share of the roses in the garden the older varieties, or are you also working in some of the new roses? Well, a lot of the roses we feature are what we call old garden roses. Chinas, noisettes, bourbons, teas, and polyanthus. And uh, there is a list of 23 roses that are called earth kind roses. These are roses that have been tested by the uh, Texas A&M Extension Service throughout the state of Texas uh, for their performance in the state. 
And those 23 roses have been called earth kind roses because they've passed the test. So they're tough. They have to be to pass that test and to be called an earth kind rose. And so there are 23 of those varieties and we feature those varieties throughout the rose garden. So the bulk of our roses are either earth kind or old garden roses. And of course, many of the earth kind roses are old garden roses. So we've really gotten away from a lot of hybrid teas, although we still have some in the garden. Let's talk about care and maintenance. That's one of the questions that we get all the time from our viewers. What would you recommend to gardeners out there who are looking at roses? I mean, I feel like roses are, they, they are the queens of the garden. Yes. It's a nearly obligatory plant, but they can sometimes be tough to care for. Well, they are, and that's why we're happy to feature the earth kind roses, because they require less maintenance. Uh, so they're, they're ideal for the homeowner who doesn't want to spend a lot of time maintaining them. We don't spray them. Uh, all we do is prune. We do prune in February, Valentine's Day. That's when we prune our roses. And then we uh, apply a spring uh, fertilization before they bloom, and then after they bloom, and then again around September 1. So we fertilize three times a year, uh, and then we mulch heavily. Uh, a good two to three inches of an organic mulch, such as shredded hardwood mulch. And uh, then we irrigate, we have to do that. But really, that's about it. You know, I think that's a, it's a great message for our viewers that selecting the right plant and plants that are designed for toughness and durability is a lot easier than having the right maintenance schedule, and exactly. especially true with roses. Right, well, that's why we're happy to have these earth kind roses because they require so much less maintenance, and uh, they're beautiful. They're, they're landscape roses, they're shrub roses, uh, and uh, they're pretty too. Most gardeners that I talk to develop their love of gardening because they grew up with it and they had a, a parent or a relative who gardened and, and oftentimes that was centered around vegetable gardening specifically. I think it's wonderful when we go to some of the nicer public gardens and they've devoted a component of their space to vegetable gardening. Well, we've done that here, Eric. In fact, we call this the backyard vegetable garden. This is a place where children of all ages, young to old, can come and learn how to garden and specifically uh, to plant vegetables and uh, maintain those vegetables and harvest those vegetables and fruits. Uh, we feature a lot of classes here for children and adults. Master gardeners use this space for some of their educational courses and then of course uh, in our education program here at the Botanic Garden we have a lot of children's classes here. So this is going to be a very well utilized garden for children and adults where they can come and uh, learn about vegetable garden and have a hands-on experience. So you tell me about the layout of this garden. It looks like it's a very accessible space. Well, it is. First of all, it is ADA accessible. Uh, we made sure of that uh, from both entrances. Uh, but we feature ground beds, raised beds. We feature an orchard of fruit trees. Uh, we feature our pomegranate collection, our fig collection, uh, and then areas that can be cultivated and changed out, uh, you know, two or three times a year. So we have permanent plantings here as well as seasonal plantings. See, there seems to be an awful lot of activity this morning in the garden. Well, there is. This is a special day for us. We're actually dedicating this garden today. The mayor will be here and some other dignitaries uh, to open up this garden and to celebrate its, uh, its renovation and its opening to the public. Well, so we're lucky enough to be here on this very special you day. You hit it just right. Awesome. <laughs> I can very vividly remember the moment in which my kids first really got excited about gardening. And it, it wasn't that different for me. It was, it was the point at which they, they came out to the vegetable garden. And at, the, at this point, they're six, seven years old. And, and they're figuring out that those seeds that we put in the ground just a few weeks earlier, now we're picking tomatoes and peppers. And, and we even had some really cool vegetables like you know the, the Japanese eggplant. And, and there was so much excitement that we're going to fill this giant basket of food bring it inside, mom's gonna cook it, and we just grew what we ate, which right. is really, really cool. That's neat. So we, we're joined today by uh, Calvin, who's already an avid gardener. How old are you, Calvin? 14. 14. Yeah. What kind of things do you like to grow? I like to grow anything that you can grow really up. My favorite thing to grow is cucumbers, because cucumbers are probably my favorite plant. I also like to grow corn. That's great. What, what got you interested in growing? Well, I mean, I just like to see, like, I don't see a plant as what it is when you put it in the ground. I see it as what it can be. Like, if you plant a seed, it turns into a cucumber, and yeah. It's, it's amazing to see that transformation from 
one little seed into a full grown plant. And it's it's not that tough to do, is it? No, it's not, it's easy. Do you want to give us a planting demonstration? We've got some sunflowers here, which of course are not only beautiful, but they attract birds and wildlife and, and also we can eat them. Yeah. But uh, why don't you show the kids out there how easy it is to grow sunflowers. Okay, you dig it a little trench, either with your finger or shovel, that's about an inch or so deep. Just use good judgment. <laughs> uh, you plant each seed, just lay it down about four inches apart. And then you just, you just cover it up really lightly, and then you pat it down. Yeah, once we get done with that, we're going to water these in and Sunflowers take, you know, just a few days to start germinating and um, by the end of the season we'll have these giant beautiful flowers full of seeds. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's almost too easy. Yeah, it really is. <laughs>Perennials are some of the funnest plants to use in the garden because we've got all these crazy colors, a lot of really interesting shapes, and uh, this, is, this is a really fun, whimsical garden with a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I like it, Eric. Uh, in fact, it used to be our cactus garden, and really? uh, then we switched over to perennials, but we've got water features here, we've got sun, we have shade, which lends itself to a variety of perennials. Uh, here we have hellebores in the foreground. Uh, the yellow flowers are the uh, columbine, columbine, one called Texas Gold. It does very well here in the spring. Uh, but then we have structure to this garden as well, permanent structure. And as you and I were discussing, the Japanese maples, the uh, oak leaf hydrangeas, we have a lot of bulbs that come up at different times of the year. So we have spring blooming perennials, summer blooming, we have fall blooming perennials. Uh, it's really a seasonal garden. You need to come here each season of the year to see what is blooming. In many ways, it's a very balanced garden. Some of the best perennial gardens, I think, are ones that are not just exclusively perennials, although there are some beautiful perennial borders that we see in gardens but you know as you mentioned a lot of the woody plant material that gives it structure and, and nice focal points we've got a lot of black leaf plants like the laura petalum uh, the cotinus one of my favorite uh, smoke trees um, and, uh, and a lot of nice strong vertical elements yes. and those create focal points in the garden we also have these really nice pathways um, that allow us to get a view from from any different side of the garden and um, and of course the uh, the water features that flow throughout. Right, exactly. It's a, it's a nice garden, uh, one that's interesting to see each season of the year. Now let me ask you about the, the preparation of this garden. You said it was a cactus garden. Of course it, it's, it's down in a bit of a depression. Were there any special soil amendments or requirements that you had to put in place to be able to grow perennials? Well, that was before my time. The cactus okay. garden was here through the 30s and I'm sure that the soil was amended then and we do that here in the garden. Anytime we prepare a new bed we, we try to mix in or bring in the right soil or at least amend the existing soil. And we often have to do that with expanded shale and aged compost. Those are two ingredients that we use here to amend our heavy clay soils. So uh, we've done that in each of our gardens that we plant. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Doing the right thing for the soil from the get-go right. definitely saves you a lot of headache down the road. Exactly, especially with perennials because they're going to be growing in this soil for years to come. So you have to prepare the soil at the beginning for the uh, years that they will be growing for you. All the gardens here are spectacular, but one garden that I think people have a particular affection for is your Japanese garden. Steve, what is it that you would want visitors to know about this place? Well, I think the history of this garden, Eric. Uh, more than 40 years ago, our former director looked at this area, which at that time was a stone quarry and a dumping ground for two world wars. He saw the topography there and thought that he could make a beautiful Japanese garden out of that spot, and he did. So in 1973, this garden opened, and it's been here now for 40 years. Wow. Let's talk about the architecture of a Japanese garden and, and the plant selection. What is it specifically that makes it a Japanese garden? Well, I think the layout as well as the plant material. This is a seven and a half acre strolling garden. So people can follow winding paths throughout the garden over varied topography as they enjoy the different plants along that route. And I think what makes a Japanese garden is that you don't see a lot of blooming color as you would in an English garden or in a perennial garden. 
Uh, here you see lots of hues and textures of green. Now we do have color, primarily in the spring, from the flowering trees and azaleas, and then we have color in the fall from the trees that turn colors. But other than that, this, this garden really consists of different shades and hues and textures of green. And I think that lends the, the tranquil feeling to this garden. It's a very serene place because of all the green. Steve, let's discuss some of the plants that have worked particularly well for you in the Japanese garden. Well, we have a wide variety of plants in here, and uh, one thing we don't do in this garden is label those plants, mm -hmm. because we thought the labels would interfere with the, uh, the setting, the tranquility of the garden. But we have a, a wide variety of hollies, we have lots of nandinas, fatsia, uh, lots of ground covers such as Asian jasmine, mondo grass, even dwarf mondo grass, and then we have flowering trees such as uh, peaches, uh, red buds, flowering uh, cherries. Uh, they give us a lot of color in the spring. We have azaleas for spring color as well. And then we even have bamboo in the garden. You know, one thing you, you said earlier is this is a study in texture. Uh, there's, there, there are a few flowering things, a little bit of color, but it's, it's mostly just everything from fine texture. We have some wider textured plants like the fascia that, that looks really, really nice. Um, and then intermediates and then some of these really, really big trees that surround the property. Exactly. Uh, the largest trees we have in the garden are the bald cypress. We have a couple of very big cottonwood trees, uh, and then a, a wide variety of uh, and selection of Japanese maples that give us the most fall color. Yeah, and some of the other intermediate trees that you've got, uh, I notice um, quite a few hollies. It's, yes. a, it's a wonderful evergreen. It's one important thing to remember too, when we're planting a garden, we've got to have some plants that, that are evergreen so that when it goes dormant, it doesn't look like it's sleeping entirely. Right, in fact, we have a lot of evergreens. Uh, in fact, this garden is very green during January and February. So because of all the green ground covers, the hollies, the Indian hawthorns, for example, are an evergreen shrub. They bloom in the spring, but the rest of the year, they're evergreen and uh, provide a nice uh, form and structure to the garden. Uh, that's true also of Asian jasmine. That's probably the most ubiquitous ground cover we have here in the, the, uh, the garden. It does well here because it takes sun or shade. And uh, so it's evergreen and uh, gives you a round color. It does. What advice would you have for someone who maybe had a very small space but wanted to install something that was similar to a Japanese garden? Well, you could create a very uh, Japanese looking courtyard in a small space or a, small, a garden in a small space. Uh, with small plants, uh, some of the dwarf nandinas like Harbor Dwarf or Flirt. Uh, uh, you could have some dwarf hill pond hollies, uh, maybe the leatherleaf mahonia. Mm -hmm. uh, you could uh, feature ground cover such as the Asian jasmine or turf such as zoysia. And maybe have a small water feature, a pool with some uh, goldfish or koi in it, uh, and uh, some rocks or a boulder. And that would create a very Japanese garden look in a small space. It's been so amazing to spend a day with you, Steve, and one sense that, that I get as we walk through this garden is of just being transformed into a new place. Um, and I really feel like this Botanic Gardens in many ways is a refuge from all the noise and the busyness of Fort Worth. It makes it a very, very special place. Well, it is. We are a, uh, a jewel for the city. This is a wonderful retreat for people, especially in an urban area. They can come here and connect with nature, uh, be among things that are green and growing, uh, they can see water and fish and birds, uh, and we need that. You know, we just need that connection with nature. And so I think that's really uh, the purpose that we serve here, among other things, uh, um, uh, for the residents of Fort Worth and for all who visit here. Yeah, from children all the way through adults, there's, there really is something here for everyone. Well, there is. Uh, you know, we have a, a tremendous educational program here for children and adults. We have special events. Uh, but primarily we're here just for people to enjoy the gardens. and. Uh, so uh, it, it gives us great pleasure to provide such a beautiful place for visitors to, to come and, and see. Well, you've done a wonderful job here, Steve. Thank you so much for sharing the day with us. Well, thank you for coming here. Another show, another amazing garden. We hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed producing it. If you watch the show, you know we travel the country visiting beautiful gardens. Well. We have a surprise in store for several in the audience. To learn more about the surprise, visit our website at Gardensmart.com. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. 
By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. Miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with Miracle Grow. Hey there, little red rabbit. You sure are looking good. <laughs> Public gardens are so much more than an elaborate collection of plants. They're a place of retreat for a community, as well as a place that people can come learn about the plants that they love and learn how to grow them. Today we met with a veteran in the industry who has dedicated his career to educating generations of plant lovers. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great gardening tips and ideas as we Garden Smart.